Um, as always, this is a Bible study, and so if you have questions or comments or whatever, throw your hand up and I'll, I'll stop and, and ask, or and, and you can ask your question and we can talk about Scripture. All right. Acts chapter 12, let's dig in. Apparently today, I don't know how they got this number really, uh, but it's estimated that 200 million Christians throughout the world are either being persecuted or are in areas that face tremendous persecuted. Did you hear that? 200 million professed Christians. Another two to 400 million are in areas where they are at least discriminated against uh, legally. And so what we're talking about here is, I don't know if you're going to math, the possibility of 600 million Christians in the world. That is almost twice as much as the population of the United States of America who are facing some kind of persecution or another. And it, it affects at least 60 nations. It's been reported by more than one that the number of Christians martyred in the 20th century was more than the number of Christians martyred all of the previous 19th century, 19th centuries combined. So, so to say that means that we, we understand and identify that persecution in the church is not a small matter. It never has been and it certainly is not today. And so I want you to have that in mind as we come across Acts chapter 12 in which there's another persecution in Jerusalem. We've seen this before. We saw in Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 6 with, uh, with Paul being thrown in prison. Peter and John, I'm sorry, Peter and John being thrown in prison and, and Stephen being martyred at the, the feet of Saul. And so we've seen persecution before here, but that persecution in, in 4, 5, and 6 really came by the temple leaders uh, that involved putting apostles in prison. And then Acts 8, we saw similar that Stephen has been put to death uh, as well. But neither of this was by the state. What we're coming to today is a different. It's a different type of persecution. We're dealing with persecution that comes from the state in Jerusalem. So we're going to cover the first 19 verses of Acts chapter 12, where there's another persecution here in Jerusalem. Remember, we're shifting focus now. We were establishing the church's central headquarters had been moved towards where? Remember the city? They moved the church headquarters north. Starts with an A, ends with an Antioch. All right, yeah. <laughs> Church in Antioch, okay? And so now we're, we're shifting the focus back to Jerusalem. Uh, here's our outline for uh, today. Uh, it's just our title, by the way. <laughs> this is our outline. It's in the title. I made it, try, try to make it easier for you. Number one, we're going to deal with persecution, and it comes in a very dramatic and sudden way. Even the way that Luke describes this, you can tell it's just kind of a sudden. It happens very suddenly. I think it's designed that way. There's persecution, then there's prayer, very briefly in verse 5, but richly described here. And then number 3, and most beautifully, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's just dive right into the text, starting with persecution in verses 1 through 5. We begin the words, now about that time, which is a context question. Okay, let's think about the context here. Here's what happened. Remember, the gospel has gone uh, to the new church headquarters up in... Antioch, all right, good. The churches are growing in Antioch, and, and then emissaries are sent down to Jerusalem to let people know the big event that happened with Cornelius, and that event was? The gospel has now gone to who? Gentiles, Gentiles right? That's a big deal. Remember Acts 1-8, it's the central focus of the book of Acts. The gospel, you will be my witnesses. And where? Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And each point in time, we see the gospel come to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. We see it in Judea and Samaria as, as, uh, as Philip's doing his ministry there in Acts chapter 8. And now in Acts chapter 10, Peter and Cornelius link up and the gospel has gone to the Gentiles. And so now they're coming down and talking about that to the Jews. And so that's the situation. That's the about time. But let's read verse 1 together. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. Okay, so who's this guy Herod? This is actually Herod Agrippa the first. And this guy is the consummate politician. We're going to look at that in a second. Interesting background for this guy named Herod. Uh, we'll learn more about him actually next week. But I want you to just get a picture of this guy's family life. You think your family life has some trouble. Listen to this guy, okay? His father, Aristobulus, was murdered by his father, Herod the Great. So his grandfather killed his father. 
Herod the Great, you remember Herod the Great, right? Remember, this is the guy who was responsible for murdering all those infants two years uh, old and under at the time of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's his grandfather who also happened to kill his father. His uncle was Antipas. He was the one who was linked with putting Jesus to death. So this is the grandson of the murderer Herod the Great. He's the son of Aristobulus who was murdered by when, and when Agrippa uh, I was a little boy. And, and this guy, Agrippa, he goes and he studies in Rome where he gets to know such illustrious figures as Caligula. And if you studied anything about Caligula ever, you know he was a real fruitcake of a Roman leader, okay? And then also, what, the guy's just weird, okay? I say that because he's super, just don't, if you study, you'll know. One name, uh, another guy by the name of Gaius, who was not quite as bad, but he preceded Caligula, uh, but was one who we would say in our culture was a few fries short of a happy meal, right? Uh, this guy was not all there either. And so these two guys who had tremendous power in Rome, they actually gave Agrippa some land. And as a result, he was made leader over that land. In fact, you know that his title that he's referred to, Herod the king, you know what that's a reference to? King over who? King of the Jews, which is an intriguing thing. It should stir your mind a little bit to think of the story of Christ. And so he was made leader or king over the better part of Israel during that time. King Agrippa had two driving concerns in his ministry or his, his, his life. Number one, he didn't like minority groups in Palestine that would threaten the social order. Uh, if you were a group that were, was coming out and you got, started having some voice and some power and the ability to threaten the establishment, Herod would stop you, okay? He was against you. It wouldn't have anything to do with race or, or culture, but anybody who tried to threaten the social order, Herod was not a fan. Number two, and probably more importantly with our context, he would do absolutely anything to keep the Jews happy. Absolutely anything. Anything to keep the Jews happy. Actually, as you look at, if, we, if you come next week, you'll know, he looked at himself as a savior, a messiah figure. And so, this, this, and he did all these things that, that appeased the Jews. He was obliged to go to the temple, his reading of the law, his identification of the people, and doing things to please them. Again, just picture the consummate politician, and this is what you have. He's currying favor with the Israelites over and over again. So, if that's the case, Herod does something else, both to keep the peace in Palestine, prevent the social order from being disrupted, and to curry favor with the Jews. What does he do? He laid hands on some who belong to the church. But the main thing he did actually stands out in verse 2. Look what the text says. And he, Herod the king, had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. Now, it's not going to say it for you here, but this is actually describing a beheading. They, they, they beheaded James, the son of thunder, the disciple of Jesus, brother of John. That's not new to this day, but right there you had three pillars, really, that started out in the church of Jerusalem in the early church. Three head figures being Peter, John, and James. We know that, that John is going to survive the longest, although he's going to be, church history says, boiled alive and persecuted and then exiled uh, to an island where he uh, writes the epistles and the revelation and, and the gospel of John. And you have Peter who's going to be martyred, but at a much later time, God's got a purpose for him. And then you have James here who is martyred. James has a very short period of time as the pillar of the church. He's beheaded by Agrippa I. But that's not enough for King Agrippa. That's not enough to, I guess, win the favor with the Jews. Because look what happens in verse 3. When he saw that, it pleased the Jews. How dark is that? Uh, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And get this. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. So think about this again. He wanted to please the Jews. He's a politician. He wants to do something that pleases people, so he does something else. He gets a hold of another pillar of the church, Peter. But it's during the days of unleavened bread. Now what's significant about that? Why would it say that it's during the days of unleavened bre bread? That's Passover, which means what? Yeah, there's no executions on Passover. Ooh. Is that, is that always true? No. 
No, it's not. Uh, But I want you to see there's tons of symbolism here between Christ's arrest, death, and persecution, and and Peter's arrest here. You're going to notice that. So you don't put anybody to death the Passover time, and and that ought to begin to make your wheels turn, right? Uh, But Peter is arrested and put into prison. Verse 4. When he had seized him, he put him into prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. Now, I like this. This is amazing uh, because there's four squads of soldiers here, which means that Peter, who was unarmed at this time, would be chained and there'd be two guards beside him and then out, outside on the door, uh, there would be two guards, maybe one inside, one outside, or both outside surrounding Surrounding Peter, just one guy. And, you know, this isn't like one of those, like, James Bond movies that's really bad, right? Where there's always, like, one designated henchman to take on James Bond. And, you know, like, okay, this is going to go easily. This is, this is four Roman guards, all armed, ready against one unarmed guy, Peter. Now, why in the world would they have four guys here to, to, to just go to watch one guy who's going to be headed likely in the morning? What do you think that was? That's true, and not only the Jesus, but Peter escaped before, you remember? Look at Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. I love this, it's so cool. Uh, You'll probably get the idea, Rye, when when you look at this text. Verse 17 says, But the high priest rose up along with his associates as a sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison. And taking him out, he said, go stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. And so they're befuddled. <laughs> How is it that these people keep getting out of prison? They're not Houdini. They're not some masterminds. And so this would be in their minds. And so now they're going to quadruple the guard for lonely Peter who's already chained to the wall. So that's the persecution that would come here. Now, church family... For the persecuted, this, this text is nothing new. And, and actually, it pains me to say that it, it's easy for me to say this, right? Because I don't know what it's like to be invaded in the middle of the night and put in jail. In a miserable, filthy, stinking prison. I've never had that happen. But church, we have to know something. This is the lot of God's people in a large part of the world. Persecution just like this still happens today. Prison and then death shortly after. What does Jesus say? If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. And I've got to admit, I, I am, I don't want to, I'm not fear mongering in any way, shape, or the form. That's not my goal here. But I am wondering how long it's going to take in this country. We are accused as Christians of wanting to start a theocracy. We're accused of Christians as uh, 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 doing hate crimes. We're accused of Christians as not wanting to give rights to other people when there's absolutely no evidence of that. There are people in this country who want to silence the Christian voice. So if you ask the question, will persecution come in our lifetime? I don't know. But I think regardless, we have to understand that this is the lot of God's people. If it does, we ought not be surprised. We ought not be fearful. We ought to know that this is how it usually goes. With, by the way, the state as at least a loyal accomplice in most cases to those who are hateful towards Christ. But I want you to see something. In light of the persecution, what does the church do? What's their answer to the persecution? They pray. That's the second thing, our heading here we have. They pray. And look at verse 5. It's just a small verse here, but it's such an impactful verse to think about. Look at what it says. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. No boycotts. No going to the prison with picket signs and saying this is unlawful. No one surges to blow up the door and get them out. None of that. In contrast to Peter being kept in prison unlawfully, they, the church, fervently prayed. 
Constant prayer was offered for him by the church. And this is a theme, by the way, that's dominant in the book of Acts and actually in the gospel of Luke. Luke, who's writing primarily to a Gentile audience, it, prayer is a continual theme over and over again. Why is that? Why is it when you go through the gospel of Luke and you go to Acts that there are continual references to prayer over and over again? Let me suggest this. Written, written to Gentiles, to pagans, especially pagan Greeks, who like Americans trusted in their own strength, in their own country, prayer is ludicrous. It's a waste of time. You can build statues, you can go to a temple, you might want to say a couple of things, but you really don't pray. Prayer's foolishness, it's idiocy. It's talking into the air. It doesn't accomplish anything. Which, let's be honest, if we're real, is exactly the way most of us think today in our culture. And I say that because otherwise, if we really wanted to accomplish something, we would pray a lot more. It doesn't fit with our powerful ways of doing things. Notice the church has recourse to pray. And why is that? I want to step back for a moment just in our... In our text, as we flow through this, I want to look at three reasons why prayer is so important. And I feel we, we probably know this, right? We know that prayer is important. We're here on a Wednesday night, after all. But let's really look at what it says here in the Word of God about why prayer is so important. Number one, prayer is important because Jesus said to pray. Jesus told us to pray. That's what he said to do. Should be enough right there. We should be able to stop and say, well, that's a win. But let's look at uh, this text. I want to look at uh, Luke 18. Even, in, even as he wrote Acts, Luke wrote this account in chapter 18, the parable of the persistent widow. Luke 18, 1. I think Acts is a demonstration of this parable, by the way. Follow along with me. It says in verse 1, Now he was telling them, Jesus was, a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. I think this text was embedded in the mind of the early church, by the way. Think about this. James has been put to death. Peter's in prison. What's happening? What's going to happen to us? And I can imagine the church saying, remember. Remember what Jesus said? He said we need to pray. He said it's necessary for us to pray and to not lose heart. Verse 2 of Luke, 8, Luke 18 says, And saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect men. At least Herod here had some sort of respect of man. Yet here comes this helpless one into the story. Verse 3, There was a widow in that city and she kept coming to him. Over and over again it implies, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. Judges didn't listen to widows, much less did a wicked judge. Yet she keeps on coming. She's like my three-year-old, right? When she wants something and I don't respond to her, there's a, there's a never-stop, non-stop, repetitive question that's asked until there's a response. Verse 4, for a while, he, being the judge, was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect men, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said... Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I think the idea here is even though there's, there's much sin around, he's, he's going to listen to you when you pray. You say, my life is so miserable. He's listening. Is he a just and good judge? Verse 8, I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith. Will he find faith on the earth? See, faith is registered by your prayers. Faith is a preservative against apostasy as prayer is. And I can imagine, just picturing myself in the context, imagine the early church saying, this is what Jesus taught us, remember Remember, he told us to pray. He didn't tell us to boycott or, or blow up the jail. He didn't tell us to lose heart and be extremely discouraged. He said it's necessary to pray and not cower and faint before the powers be. So Luke's illustrating that the church did exactly what King Jesus said. They're praying. That's one reason they prayed. The second reason they prayed 
is that they really knew that even as speaking to man was a means by which they were brought to Christ, right? God is sovereign over salvation, and yet the means by which he saves is you and I, his people, bringing his gospel. That's the tool he uses, the means he uses. So even as speaking to man was a means of which they were brought to Christ, so speaking to God is a means by which Christ's kingship is exercised on their behalf. That's why they prayed, because they knew it's how God decided to work his kingship, his lordship in their lives. I love this. They were not the hyper-Calvinist, right, who said, oh, well, God ordained that Peter's going to get out of prison, and so he's just going to get out of prison. You just need to trust. You don't have to pray. Just trust. They said, Lord, we want Peter out of prison We want him to have a testimony in prison. Lord Jesus, we speak to you to act on his behalf. Look at Philippians 1.19. Paul's in prison. He's in a stinking, filthy, likely rat-infested prison, a hole in the ground. And look at what Paul says. That is going to, this all, the situation, him being in prison, it's all going to work out for the furtherance of the gospel. How? Paul says this. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He doesn't even put the provision of the Spirit first because we're supposed to pray for that exact thing. He says, I know I'm going to be delivered because you're praying. You say, Paul was going to be delivered because God's sovereign and and he had decreed it. I know that. That is absolutely true, yes. But that's not what Paul says. He says, I know I'm going to be delivered because you're praying and the Spirit will come. Can you say that when you pray? I know God is going to bless and I know he's going to work because we prayed that God would bless. And we prayed that God would work. The little book of Philemon 22 doesn't have a chapter, it's just one chapter. Paul's writing again to Philemon, the slave owner. And Paul again, by the way, is in prison here too. And look what he says. It says, at the same time, also prepare me a lodging. For I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Whether Paul knew this by immediate revelation or not, he said, my hope is that through your prayers I'll be given to you. See, church, we really, let me be honest, we're really unbelievers when it comes to prayer. What does the Bible say? Ask and maybe it'll be given to you. Knock and maybe it'll be open to you. Seek and and possibly you'll find it if God wills it. That's not what Jesus says. And yes, of course, we we pray in the filters of God's word that we looked at a couple weeks ago through the Gospel of John and, and John chapter 12, right? We pray with those filters in mind, certainly, yes. But I, I, one of the reasons that I am confident that here at First Baptist Church of Grey Gables, that I'm confident of God's blessing here is because our people pray. Because you tell me that. You ask me that. We believe that. One of the reasons that I'm confident when this buffoon gets up there on Sunday morning and preaches the word of God that I know it'll be effective is because of this sweet lady that prays over each one of these pews every morning. Because the the people on our prayer team who are praying for us every Sunday, we believe that. So they knew in a real sense, even as words to man were instruments to bring people to God in Christ, that words to God were a means by which Christ and his power came to man, particularly to Peter in prison. Oh, I'm doing good on time. All right, number three. The number three reason. Third reason why they prayed is because this is the way the church waged war. Remember, we talked in Zechariah about the weapons of the church And I feel bad because I've been using this over and over again that the two main weapons of the church to fight a a culture are the sharing of the gospel. But remember the other one? The the discipline of the church, right? Forgive me. Because I'm missing maybe the greatest weapon we have as a a church. It's prayer. This This is the way we wage war. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. James 5.17 it says. 
written by not the James that was just martyred, but the one later on we'll get to. Church, prayer is how the church wages war. The state had warred against the church, and now the church is using its weapon of warfare. John Piper has it exactly right. He's got a beautiful illustration about this. He he refers to every single soldier on the field, each one in the trench, as well as the general, has a walkie-talkie. And with that walkie-talkie in prayer, they have an immediate access to the commander and chief Jesus to ask what is necessary, and he acts. He works. So they're using their walkie-talkie to come before God in prayer. Friends, it's the same thing with us. Exact same thing with us. We don't throw around the world the word, hey, I'm praying for you, brother. We are faithfully praying. We actually pray. Does that mean that we're particularly pious in some way? No, it means that's our warfare. The reason why we don't pray as we should, and that goes for all of us, is because we really don't think we're at war. We basically have a peace with our economy and and our society. Nice, easy, just do what the culture does and we'll be fine. Who needs to pray? So we, we don't pray. But let me tell you something. You let persecution come. Let you be gripped with an unsaved child or relative. Let you be gripped by the fact that you are helpless to do anything in any situation and you will pray. If you don't, God help you. You see, it's like this, a persecution across the globe. Let's be honest, it's, it's distant from us. Unless your son or daughter is on the mission field. When you know they're going door to door, then you're listening to every newscast and then you pray. Church, I honestly, I don't know what it's going to take. But God is going to have to show us that we are in a war before we really begin to pray. Or to pray like this. This church did. They did. God sent persecution and they prayed. Now, I want to close verses 6 to 17 really quickly to show the power of Christ. I know that's a lot of text. We're going to walk through it verse by verse here. This is really where it gets fascinating. The story gets a little narrative and I I love it. Beginning verse 6. It's after the Passover now. Which means what? He's allowed lawfully to to be killed. And so look look at what happens. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. Isn't that great? What's Peter doing? (laughs) I don't know if you've ever, like, faced the fact that you're going to die the next day, right? Uh, But I, I can tell you, in all honesty, I... I'm not sure I'd be able to sleep, right? Much less as soundly as we're about to see Peter was sleeping. I love this. He's going to get up in the morning and he's got one thing on his to-do list, likely get his head chopped off, right? And Peter is the one who, of course, wrote, cast all your cares upon the... because he cares for you. I could see him saying, Lord, with all this persecution coming, that's great. I'll get to go heaven earlier. But it's still your church. It's wonderful, and it's a a deep sleep, too. He's got these handcuffs on. He's surrounded by soldiers. They're watching over the prison. And look what Luke says in verse 7. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. That angel of the Lord, by the way, is not some stranger that came off the street with a master key, okay? It's the angel of the Lord who was sent from heaven, a a ministering spirit sent forth to the ministers who are those who are the heirs of salvation. What's amazing is the guards don't wake up. Four guards there and they all fall asleep. They're on three hour shifts and they can't stay awake. So they were in a sleep or a stupor. And did you notice what he did to Peter? Struck him in the side, right? I don't know if he kicked him or pushed him or what, but, but you know what it's like if you ever had to get a, a teenager up for anything, right? Uh, and, and it's even worse if, if you don't expect it. The light comes on, wake up. Peter, by the way, is in a daze through most of this. And I can imagine Peter saying, I have chains on. No problem. Now you don't. Now it's gone. Look at verse 8. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Gird yourself means put on your toga, your, your outer garment. Get your shoes on, Peter. 
You can just imagine the angel saying, come on, Peter, get up. Get up, put your clothes on, put your shoes on. We gotta get out of here, you gotta make it quick. If you, get, if you have young kids in any way, shape, or form, you know exactly what Peter's going through in this moment, right? It's what Peter feels like. Verse nine, and he went out and continued to follow and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. I think Amy and I on most mornings now that we have a three-year-old and one-year-old, uh, most of the time we're discussing what actually happened in the middle of the night and what we thought might have happened in the middle of the night, right? Because it's all unclear to us during the day. This is what Peter's doing here. He had no idea if this was real, if it was a vision or a dream or, or maybe a nightmare. He was confused. It's all happening so fast. Verse 10. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads out into the city, which opened for them by itself, the world's first automatic door. And they, uh, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. That's the work of the angel. He makes his escape from the jail cell, leads him out to the street. And verse 11 is most significant now. Peter's awake, and look what happens. When Peter came to himself, I don't know if he had a cup of coffee or what, that's usually... How that happens in my life. Now I know for sure, that's what he said, that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And what were they expecting? Yeah, basically this guy who had the audacity to introduce the Jews to the Gentiles. Get rid of them. Peter says, they don't get the last word. And the reason why this happened is because, I don't know if you've heard this before in the book of Acts. But the theme of the book of Acts is that Jesus is alive and he is at work. Absolutely. He sent his angel from heaven. Why did Jesus do this? No doubt because his people had been praying that Peter would be delivered from prison. Don't forget that. The church with its resources before the throne of grace in prayer is far more powerful than all of the kingdoms of this world put together. That's why prayer is important. That's why it's essential. Verse 12. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Where do you go in the middle of the night? Immediately he wants to go to the church. Apparently he had some sort of inclination that the church was going to pray. So he comes to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. Some incidentally believe that this is actually the place where the upper room was that we've been studying the gospel of John 14 where Jesus and the disciples were. And this was a, apparently a house that was kind of like the church building uh, where they met and they were gathered. Many of them were praying together. And, and here's where the humor comes in. He's on the street. It's dark. There's no light besides maybe the moon possibly. He makes his way there and he knocks. It's me, Peter. Hello. Now let's think about this. Look at verse 13. I love this. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Okay, so let's just picture this. You're in the middle of the night. You're praying. What do you think if Herod's harassing the church and then all of a sudden there's a knock on the door? I know what you're thinking. Uh-oh. We're next. So these are very bold people here. So they send their servant girl, Rhoda, out to check out what's going on. Really, really bold and brave of the church here. And she, she rose up to answer. And she goes out through the door, through the courtyard. She's likely scared. And somehow Peter's probably saying, hey, it's me. Let me in. Probably didn't say his name because there were probably neighbors who may have been part of the Jewish sect that wanted him dead. And look what happens in verse 14. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. I love this. <laughs> she is so thrilled. She's in the dark. She hears Peter's voice. She turns around and goes back, leaving the guy outside. You can just picture Peter being like, what are you doing? Let me in. It's me. Please don't leave me out here any longer. They're actually really trying to kill me. Would you let me in, please? See, that's the humanity of the Bible. I could just picture me doing something like this, right? She can't get over this. She runs. She says, Peter's standing at the gate. And here are the people praying that God would deliver people, uh, Peter. Oh, Lord, deliver him. Lord, show your power. We don't know exactly what they're praying, but that's probably the way we would pray, right? So she comes and she says, Peter's at the door, guys. It's amazing. And they said, you're crazy. That's nah, not true. I don't believe it. They're not even praying with much faith, are they? And yet God's still faithful to answer their prayers. Verse 15, they said to her, you're out of your mind. 
She kept insisting that this was so. They kept saying, it's his angel. It's, it's just an illusion. Sweetheart, you were just so optimistic. that that's, that's just what you thought you saw. And then they start to listen and they hear Peter. Please let me in, somebody. I'm still knocking out here. with somebody please let me in? In verses 16 and 17. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led them out of prison. And he said, report these things to James and the brethren. And then he left and went to another place. He probably had woken up half the neighborhood at this point. I don't know if you've ever heard annoying knocking like that. But he tells them the theme of this passage, which is how the Lord led him out of prison. Not first that he's just out of prison now. But how Jesus is alive and he's at work. Jesus answered your prayers. Jesus brought me out of prison. And they said, now you go tell James, the brother of Jesus, not the martyred one. And so that's the power of Christ demonstrated. Now listen, does this always happen this way? No. James, the brother of John, was still martyred. John was threatened. They didn't do anything with John, but... But friends, it's always important to know that Christ is in control and he always, always, always does what is best and right for his church. I want you to see the aftermath. Verse 18, now when they came, when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. Here's the reason why there's no small disturbance here. If you're a captor and you have one of the captive and that captive is let go, the punishment that was going to come to that captive comes to you. Verse 19. Don't share this part with your children. I'm just kidding. It's the word you can. When Herod had searched for him and had not found him, he examined the guards in order that they be led away to execution. And then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and was spending time there. That is Peter. I just want to wrap this up this way and then we have a couple minutes to talk. What's the lesson of this passage? What have we seen so far? Number one, persecution is going to come. For God's people, eventually it will come, friends. If they persecute me, they'll persecute you. Persecution is going to come. Number two, what are the weapons of the church? What are the weapons of the church? It's not crusades, it's not bombs, it's not terrorism, any of that. That's the world's view. You pray. And oh, that we would learn that lesson of prayer. That's why along with preaching, the most important thing we can do as a church is pray. Are you a part of that? Do you pray? Are you part of the church's most important work? Number three, we see the power of Jesus in every single age to reign over his enemies. Power of Jesus always to reign over his enemies. Psalm 110, 1 and 2. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion and rule in the midst of your enemies. Church family, do you believe that? It's how the church thrives in all the world. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and it will never be destroyed because Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Always. Okay, that's all I got for tonight. Any questions, points of discussion, things I missed, observations, complaints, yada, yada, yada. Miss Carrie. Where it says, um, Mary, the mother of John, mm -hmm. whose other name is Mark, yeah. is that Jesus' mother? It's not. It's John Mark, who we're going to see later on. Really, it's, it's actually the, the guy who wrote Mark. It's his gospel. Um, so really, he's more referred to in, in Mark in some of the sense. But this is, this is John Mark. He and the Apostle Paul are going to have a, a beef coming up in, um, in Acts. Not over Twitter or anything, but uh, they're going to have a little bit of an argument. So it's not the Gospel of John. We don't know where John is. But I, think, I imagine you know where I think John is. I think he's grieving and hiding. John lost his brother in this, this mess. And so I, I just assume that. I have no recollection of that. Yeah. Question, Miss Becky? Was, was this the Agrippa that was all those persuaded? Uh, no. No, we'll see what happens to this Agrippa uh, come next week. This was not the <laughs> Agrippa that's almost persuaded. But there is a King Agrippa uh, later in the, in the Acts. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, that's all we got. Let's pray together. 
Lord, we pray, Father, that you uh, would, would cause us, incite us to go out into our world and recognize that Jesus does rule in the midst of his enemies. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in China and North Korea and Sudan and Mexico and Cuba and Saudi Arabia and Nigeria, Uganda, or so many other areas and places of the world where there is more or less real persecution of your people. Father, we pray that your churches will learn to use their most powerful weapon, which is prayer. Father, we pray, God, that you would show your power in their midst as you've done in the past and as you continue to do so. Lord, remind us that you do give your angels charge over your people to guard them in all of their ways. Lord, may we now go forth today with this refreshment to know that Jesus is king and he will reign until all of his enemies remain a footstool under his feet. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.